Hello and welcome to those of you who have logged in a little bit early for the meeting on modulator treatments for cystic fibrosis. We will be allowing people time to join the Zoom call and we'll start promptly at 12.02. Thank you. See if it looks like that. Um, looks like the webinar is still starting on my screen. So I'm not sure anybody heard that. Up oh, here, we're going in now. And so Steve, I would say, say that one more time. Hi and welcome. Thank you for logging in early to the meeting on modulator treatments for cystic fibrosis. We will give people a couple minutes to join through the Zoom call. So we will be starting at around 12.02. Thank you. Hello, thank you for joining the ICER meeting on modulator treatments for cystic fibrosis. To give people time to enter the Zoom call, we'll be starting at approximately 12.02. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the California Technology Assessment Forum's meeting on modular treatments for cystic fibrosis effectiveness and value. My name is Paul Heidenreich and chair of the CTAF panel. And at the beginning of every CTAF meeting, we want to ensure that all speakers disclose any financial relationships with industry. Every member of our CTAF panel who's present today has met the ICER conflict of interest policy. Um, and now we'll go through and ask each uh, CTAF member to briefly introduce themselves, their work, and note whether they have any updates to uh, any relationships. Uh, so I'll begin uh, again, Paul Heidenreich. I'm a cardiologist uh, at Stanford and uh, head of medicine at the Palo Alto VA, um, and I have uh, no updates. And now I'll, I'll read out the different panelist names. Um, we'll start with the vice chair, uh, Rena Fox. Hi, I'm Rena Fox. I'm uh, a general internist at UCSF, and I have no updates. Thank you. Uh, Ralph Brindis. Hi, I'm Ralph Brindis. I'm a clinical professor of medicine at UCSF, a cardiologist, and I have no conflict. Thank you. Um, Rick Seiden. I am a patient advocate, and I have no conflicts. Um, thank you. 
I know uh, Dr. Redberg uh, has had to step away for a moment. Uh, Dr. Rita Redberg, from, uh, she's a cardiologist and professor of medicine at UCSF, and she had no updates as well. Um, Robert Collier. I got on mute. I'm Bob Collier, a uh, patient advocate who's specializing in working with researchers for almost 30 years right now. Uh, no thank problem. you. Uh, uh, Say Lee. Uh, Say Lee, a professor of medicine and a geriatrician at UCSF and the San Francisco VA. No conflicts. Thank you. Anne Raldo. My name is Ann Raldo. I am an assistant professor in radiation oncology at UCLA, and I have no updates. Thank you. Brian O'Sullivan. Hi, I'm a uh, Professor of Pediatrics at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in New Hampshire. I'm also a co director of the Cystic Fibrosis Pediatric Program at Dartmouth Hitchcock. And I have taken part in clinical trials sponsored by Vertex, but I do not get any money from Vertex, so I have no further conflicts. Uh, thank you. Uh, Felicia Cohn. Felicia Cohn, I'm the bioethics director for Kaiser Permanente in Orange County and a clinical professor at the University of California, Irvine, no conflicts. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Klingman. Yeah, I'm Jeff Klingman. I'm the chair of neurology at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, uh, no conflicts. Thank you. Uh, Joy Melnikow. I'm Joy Melnikow. I'm a family physician and professor in the Department of Family Medicine at UC Davis, and I direct the UC Davis Center for Healthcare Policy and Research. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly Gregory. Good morning. I'm a professor in uh, OBGYN, a subspecialist in medicine at Cedar sinai Medical Center and UCLA School of Public Health, and I have no updates. Thank you. And uh, finally, Neil uh, Kohatsu. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Um, my background is in preventive medicine. I'm a physician. I work at UC Davis doing population health research. Thank you, everyone. Um, at this point, I'll <clears throat> turn to our patient and clinical experts to also introduce themselves and declare any potential conflicts of interest. Um, we'll start with um, Dr. Uh, Carlos Mia. Yes, I'm Carlos Mila. I'm a professor at uh, Stanford University School of Medicine, and I'm uh, also a pediatric pulmonary physician at Lucy Packard Children's Hospital, where I direct the Cystic Fibrosis Center. Um, I have no updates to my disclosures. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Manu Jain. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am the uh Adult Program Director for the Adult CF Program at Northwestern University, where I'm a professor of medicine and pediatrics. Uh, and I have no updates to my previous disclosures. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mary Dwight. I am Mary Dwight. I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Policy Officer at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and I have no updates to my disclosures. Thank you. Uh, Mariah Hanley. Hi, I'm Mariah Hanley. I'm a patient with cystic fibrosis and I have no updates. Thank you. And uh, Don Kreese. Good morning, everybody. I am Don Kreese, the dad of a thriving 18-year-old young woman with cystic fibrosis, and I have no conflicts to disclose. Thank you, everyone. And I'll ask... Is that what that was? I just... Thank you. Um... um We'll ask at this point that uh, any additional speakers throughout the day, um, including the policy roundtable participants, or those making public comments, please um, announce any financial relationships with industry or other influences or judgment um, before you speak. Um, and we'll also be presenting this information publicly on the slides. So at this point, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Steve Pearson, who will uh, continue our program uh, Dr. Pearson is president of the Institute uh, for Clinical and Economic Review that oversees uh, CCAS work. Uh, Dr. Pearson. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you to the members of CTAF and our guest experts and others. I really, for those of you who have been to ICER uh, kind of convened appraisal meetings, 
<clears throat> I know that we are not going to have the same ability to feel like we're interacting, obviously. Um, I really do want to extend my thanks to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation um, and others who um, helped us uh, as we you know, went into a pause phase on this uh, meeting, but was, it was able to kind of turn back to it with, um, with their help and effort. So thank you again to all those who've been involved. And I'm sure that this being a five hour ish Zoom meeting means that absolutely nothing will go wrong technically. We will have no glitches. Nobody's dog will decide to introduce him or herself um, in the middle of a talk or anything like that. Um, we want to keep the same sense that we can hear from each other and deliberate on the evidence and the broader aspects um, of value and the meaningfulness of these innovations for patients and their families. So we will do the very best we can uh, with the technical um, platform we have, and I hope we, we can accomplish um, a fair amount. Next slide, please. So why are we here today? I have lots of animations, I'm sorry. Next slide, or just next. So um, we start sometimes by saying, so what happens the day that these treatment, the treatment like Trikafta is approved by the FDA? And in one word, you can say celebration. Uh, this is another one of those situations where, um, and in this case, a large segment of patients who were um, kind of burdened by a tremendously significant illness, they and their families. Um, and when years of research, years of clinical trial participation, years of um, failure leading to further tries, when all of that culminates in a new treatment that can really make a significant difference in people's lives, we all celebrate. Um, on multiple levels. Next, please. The other thing that starts to come to the surface though is that as a treatment moves from that moment, that kind of crystalline moment of FDA approval, very rapidly people start to wonder, what's it gonna cost? How's it going to be covered by insurance? Will my doctor have access to it, et cetera? And we all know that not just in cystic fibrosis, but in, for many types of new innovations, there can be difficulties for patients in different ways. Again, through coverage, through costs in different ways. And that this becomes part of the larger landscape when we talk about how we move an innovation from that celebratory moment into, a, a, in, into clinical practice in a way that really helps patients and is sustainable for the entire system. Next. So here's where, again, this term system can seem very impersonal sometimes because we do talk about it. Um, so I wanted to give just a couple of slides to try to bring a little bit more humanity, if you will, to that concept next. So forgive the roughness of this PowerPoint. Um, it, it expresses the maximum extent of my skills on PowerPoint, which you will see are quite limited. But a system tends to mean that we are all part of it. And in this way, one way to visualize this is that we have some patients, and you see the kind of single larger figure on the right, um, where they will be the ones who will receive a treatment and benefit from it. And in the background, but in some ways balanced with that ability to treat that individual patient and family, um, are others who are maybe going to get sick with something else, maybe not, they're contributing financially to the system that supports all of us, whether we are already ill or will be soon. At some point, all of us will be. So there is this implicit balance and structure that any insurance system, whether it be a public insurance system like Medicare or Medicaid, or whether it be a private insurance system has to try to achieve. Next. And so what happens sometimes is that we have to think about if we are spending resources to care for certain patients within a healthcare system, a community, if you wish to kind of make it a little bit more personal, then we have a, a potential for an imbalance to occur. And when we care for people who are ill, who are in the office, we can see them with our eyes. And again, we want to recognize and advance their treatment. If you advance one more on the slides, Sometimes we run the risk of creating a system that's out of balance and making it harder for others to afford to stay in the system. Now, this is different if it's a publicly funded system. You know, no one drops out of Medicaid because you can't afford Medicaid. But it implicitly happens at the societal level when states are trying to make judgments about 
who has eligibility for Medicaid. If the costs of care are too much, they may change their eligibility um, criteria and make it harder for working adults to join. So this is again part of the challenge of trying to recognize and reward innovation and to make sure that it's accessible because that in many cases should not be what's really being negotiated. But we have to do it in a way that opens up an opportunity to make sure that everybody can stay healthy in the system and have their condition, their treatment also covered well. Next, please. So again, to try to make this a little bit more personal and, and briefly, these are just some quotes from people who either felt that they had to drop health insurance or are still kept insurance, but maybe moved into a much higher deductible version of it. Um, or have just even with insurance have struggled to afford care. And you can see some of these quotes if you kind of scan through them with your eyes. You know, we're not poor people, but we can't afford health insurance. I'm almost 60 years old and I can't go see a doctor. I live in a constant state of fear. These are from an article, the sources there at the bottom of this slide. Um, but as we all know, even before the pandemic hit, within the past couple of years, more than 2 million Americans had dropped out of the insurance system and had fallen in the cracks between private insurance and Medicaid and the exchange system. So we have real people that are struggling um, who may not be in the room, if you will, with us today as we talk about value and other things for this particular set of treatments, but who in some sense need to be part, I think, of our broader ethical thinking of what we're trying to accomplish when we seek you know, really good um, access for new innovative treatments. And one last slide on this point is just to put a face on it, because again, even if we were together in person, we wouldn't see the folks. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to read through the, the specific descriptions of each of these individuals, but these are some of the individuals. They're actually not the folks from whom the quotes were taken um, with their stories of how they um, basically either dropped insurance or had to drop health insurance for their employees because of the rising cost of care. So it's just to realize that there are individuals, families, and they may have illnesses, and yet they still feel like they cannot um, easily afford their health care um, insurance. And if they do, they often still end up uh, delaying their care or rationing it themselves within their family. Next slide. So we're back again to try to tackle that broader issue of of, uh, if you will, if you want to keep the scale metaphor um, or analogy, we've got a balance between the celebration and the need to think about others in our society who are struggling uh, with the cost of healthcare insurance and with healthcare. And we have to make sure that everything contributes to the ability to welcome and celebrate these kinds of innovations, to be able to talk about the evidence, where there might be gray zones, but basically ultimately to also think about how the value is, is recognized, rewarded in a way that can help everybody. So the organizational inter, uh, overview, I should say, of what we're gonna do today. You've met the members of the California Technology Assessment Forum. I need to tell you very briefly about um, ICER, the Institute for Clinical Economic Review, which uh, kind of convenes these meetings and is the kind of academic secretariat behind it. Next. First, our own um, funding and conflicts are shown in this slide, which we keep updated on our website. This is all sources of funding this year. You can see 70% coming from nonprofit foundations. The largest of those is the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. We also receive funding from the California Healthcare Foundation. We've received funding this year from Commonwealth Fund um, for specific projects and a couple other smaller nonprofits. About 29 to 30%, as you can see, of our revenue comes directly for a policy summit program that we run for health plans and for manufacturers. Um, and that money is not allocated to the research function that we do on these reports and these meetings. And we have a very small sliver left over, I think, from a, a, a government contract. Next slide. So the report that is the background, if you will, or the foundation in many ways of the, what we'll be talking about today how is it developed? It starts with a long phase of what we call scoping, which means basically opening up our ears and trying to be quiet and listening to patients, patient groups, clinical experts, the manufacturers themselves, and other stakeholders because we don't know what we don't know sometimes coming into an area. Following that, we go off in a sense, if you will, to 
kind of do a deep dive into the evidence. And we work often with outside academic colleagues. In this case, we work with UCSF on the evidence analysis of clinical effectiveness and with um, academic faculty at the University of Minnesota on the cost effectiveness modeling. All of that work goes through phases of public comment and revision. And we are also fortunate to have as expert reviewers, um, two of the clinical experts who have already introduced themselves, Dr. Jane and Dr. Mia, as well as Dr. Sullivan and um, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation was kind enough to also um, uh, review it and provide comment. So the report itself, um, how is it structured to support the, uh, the, the deliberation today? Next slide. So in a picture, a diff different kind of picture, and many of you have seen this before, but just to restate for those who are new to the process, um, we feel that this entire effort, ICER's mission, um, the report, these meetings, has as its goal to achieve a healthcare system in which we can have fair pricing, fair access, and future innovation for everybody. To support that, we think that decision-making around um, interventions in the healthcare system, whether they're new or old, have to look at different um, facets of information. Next. Two of them we've divided into terms that we call long-term value for money. Think about it again. It's really long-term and whether we can achieve that, that goal um, requires that we think hard about long-term aspects of whether what the clinical and broader benefits are and how much it costs. Also, we have to think about the short-term affordability, especially if there's a very large population, that's not gonna be the case today, but sometimes something could be a good long-term value for money, but still create a significant short-term affordability concern. Next, long-term value for money, and this reflects the structure of the report, and to some extent, the discussion today is divided into sections on the comparative clinical effectiveness, the incremental cost effectiveness, and we'll talk also extensively about things that might not be captured or even capturable within those two first buckets, things that we call potential other benefits or disadvantages of treatment and some broader contextual considerations. And next, just to show that the short-term affordability is supported, considerations around that are supported by an analysis of potential budget impact in the report, um, but we will not be discussing that at length today. Next. So, the agenda briefly after this, um, we've run a little bit over schedule just because of the, I think the Zoomness of it all, um, but we're gonna try to run a tighter meeting than we usually do because I think Zoom does tend to kind of suck the oxygen out of a room and make it hard for people to really feel like they're hearing each other. We're gonna talk first about the evidence of clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness. There will be a phase where we'll have public comments and discussion about those comments. We will have a break from 1045 to 11, come back for further deliberation and voting. Then we will have lunch, um, far too late for those of us on the East Coast, but those on the West Coast will probably feel it's too early. And then we'll come back for the policy roundtable, the goal of which is really to move from talking about the evidence to what's, what's going to happen in the real world of patients, of families, of doctors caring for them, of insurance coverage, of pricing and future research. So we will close with a brief round of final reflections from the members of the CTAF and we aim to adjourn by 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Next slide. I've, you've already met the clinical experts. So again, um, just, and they've already even probably, I think they've mentioned their financial conflicts of interest, but for full transparency, we have these slides and I'm not going to read through them again. Here's for Dr. Jane and Dr. Mia. Next slide. Our patient experts, as you've also met, and they have provided this information on their conflicts of interest. I'm not going to read all of these as well, but I'll let you spend a couple of seconds browsing it with your eyes. And for the next slide, I think I'm almost ready to turn it over. Good, I am. Uh, to Professor uh, and Dr. Jeff Tice from UCSF. Jeff, take it away. Great, thanks, Steve. I will uh, try to uh, get us back on time. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, oh, next slide, please. I want to acknowledge uh, my collaborators on the uh, clinical evidence uh, uh, section of the report. Uh, none of us have any uh, conflicts of interest to report. Next slide. So we're here to talk about cystic fibrosis. And uh, as most people in the room know, the pathogenesis uh, of uh, the disease is related to 
mutations in the gene that codes for the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conduct conductance regulator, a mouthful, so we talk about it as the, the CFTR gene. And the protein uh, coded by this gene is important for chloride and other anion transportation across cell membranes. There are more than 1,800 uh, mutations in the gene that are associated with the uh, uh, cystic fibrosis. And it's important to recognize that, you, uh, that each of us carry two copies of the gene for CFTR. Um, and that in order to have the uh, clinical manifestations of cystic fibrosis, both copies of the gene have to have deleterious mutations. So people with just half the normal function, so one functional copy of the CFTR gene, make enough protein uh, to not uh, manifest the symptoms of cystic fibrosis. Next slide. And this, uh, it, uh, we often think about cystic fibrosis uh, as a disease of the lungs, but it's really a multi-system disease, as uh, patients no doubt will attest to uh, dur during their commentary. It involves uh, uh, impacts on the pancreas, the skin, uh, the liver, the intestines, fertility, and it greatly impacts uh, quality of life um, and uh, um, uh, mental health. Next slide, please. Uh, disease management has changed dramatically over the past uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, we now diagnose the disease much earlier. Most uh, children are diagnosed soon after birth. And treatment has greatly improved both the quality and length of life for patients with CF. However, a best supportive care, uh, which this reflects, uh, involves a, a number of different therapies. I've listed a few here, um, and it's uh, burdensome for patients. On average, one to three hours a day are spent on uh, the therapies to uh, try and limit the progression of uh, symptomatic uh, CF. Uh, more recently, um, we have the CFTR modulators, which are uh, the focus uh, of the uh, 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 process today. Um, and they are the first uh, therapies directed at uh, the underlying pathophysiology of the disease. Next slide, please. So uh, there are four um, CFTR modulators uh, that are FDA approved. Today, we're going to focus on Trikafta. The uh, full report also updates uh, the prior report on uh, Simdico, Orcambi, and Kaleidico. But today, we're going to focus on Trikafta. And the comparators uh, in, in the review um, are best supportive care, but also the other uh, CFTR modulators when they're indicated for the same uh, population of patients. And next slide, please. So here's what I mean by population. Uh, we've uh, divided up the uh, report in, into a, a focus on four separate populations. Population one are uh, individuals with specific mutations that have indications for Kaleidico. Um, the uh, second population, population two, uh, is patients who carry two copies of the mutation known as F508 del. Um, this is the most common mutation. Um, population three has one copy of that mutation and uh, a, a, another mutation, that second mutation uh, that has some residual function, so-called a residual function mutation. And finally, population four is a, uh, a patient uh, with uh, uh, one copy of the F508 del mutation and a second mutation that has minimal function. And I want to highlight this population now. Uh, there were no drugs uh, prior to Trikafta, um, which uh, uh, helped patients uh, with uh, this uh, combination of mutations. Um, patients in populations two, three, and four represent about 90% of uh, patients with cystic fibrosis, and they are all eligible for this new therapy, Trikafta. Next slide, please. The outcomes, uh, uh, I, of course, we're going to focus on the, uh, the pulmonary outcomes, and this is usually measured by uh, the amount of air uh, that can be blown out in one second, the forced expiratory volume, or FEV1, and it's normalized uh, to uh, the percent predicted, 100% being normal. Um, uh, we're also looking at uh, pulmonary exacerbations, which often result in uh, hospitalizations, IV antibiotics, and uh, significant decremented quality of life for patients, and we'll also focus on quality of life. Uh, there are a number of other outcomes that we would like to look at, but uh, in part because the trials are relatively uh, short, uh, uh, have uh, minimal reporting uh, on them um, for today's uh, evidence review. Next slide, please. 
So uh, turning to the actual data, we're going to start with population two. Um, these are the patients who carry two copies of the F508 Dell mutation. Um, there's one pivotal head-to-head -head trial with Simdico. Um, so this uh, Simdico already carries an indication for this population. Uh, the study randomized 170 uh, participants ages uh, 12 and above. Um, the trial started with a four-week run-in with Simdico, so everybody got Simdico, and then they were randomized either to continue Simdico or uh, to take Trikafta. It was a well-done uh, trial, so a good quality trial, and the primary outcome was the absolute change in uh, FEV1, how much that improved, and so there was an absolute improvement of 10% compared to the, uh, the therapy that we already thought was a good therapy, Simdico, um, and this was highly statistically significant. Also, um, the quality of life uh, measure on the respiratory domain uh, improved by 17.4 points uh, versus Simdico. So again, against an active comparator. And this is huge. The minimally clinically important difference, an improvement of four points is considered important for patients. And here we had uh, more than four times that. So a huge improvement in at least respiratory quality of life. Next slide, please. To put this in perspective, we did a network meta-analysis where we included all of the trials in this population, uh, those for Orcambi, Simdico, and Trikafta. And you can see uh, that uh, even though Orcambi and Simdico were approved for this population, the, the benefits uh, in terms of uh, changes in FEV1 are dwarfed by those uh, achieved by Trikafta. Next slide. And here we have the similar uh, uh, findings for uh, the change in the quality of life measure. Um, I, you had a two to five point improvement. Uh, and of course, five points is considered uh, clinically significant for Syndico, uh, but Trikafta a much higher uh, uh, improvement versus uh, placebo, 22 points, and again, about 17 points greater uh, than uh, Syndico. Next slide, please. So with that, we're going to turn to the third population. Uh, these are patients who uh, carry one copy of the F508 Dell mutation and a second uh, mutation where the protein has some residual function. Now, Trikafta, when we uh, did the, uh, wrote up the review, there were no data in this population. However, there was an ongoing uh, study. That study has been completed and there's a press release about it, but it does not yet give details on um, the outcomes uh, in this population. Um, so we don't have any uh, relevant data yet. However, we have evaluated uh, uh, Trikafta in this population anyway, uh, because Trikafta is simply Simdico plus a, a third uh, drug, Alexacafter. Um, and in the head-to-head -head trial between Simtico and, and, and Trikafta, we didn't see any additional adverse events associated with Trikafta, and the benefits seemed at least as good, in fact, much better in the homozygous population. So we expect uh, the benefits from Trikafta to be at least as good as those of Simtico and likely much greater. Um, and so when we get to the evidence ratings, you'll see even though we have no data in this population, we actually gave it an evidence rating. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, the fourth population, this is a population that, uh, of, of patients who had no available therapy, um, uh, at least no available modulator therapy. So this uh, trial was much larger, uh, 403 patients, uh, also ages 12 and above. Um, they were uh, randomized to Trikafta or placebo and followed for a longer period, 24 weeks. Again, uh, this was a good quality uh, trial and the primary outcome was the change in FEV1. Um, there was a 14.3% uh, increase, uh, absolute increase compared with placebo, and a 20 uh, point increase in the quality of life uh, measure. Um, so uh, a, a very large improvement there. This trial was long enough where they were able to actually assess uh, the rates of pulmonary exacerbations. Again, uh, serious uh, infections in the lung requiring hospitalization and IV antibiotics in most cases. And there was a two thirds reduction, uh, highly statistically significant for patients who received Trikafta rather than placebo in this trial. Next slide, please. The harms with all of the CFTR modulators have been really mild and self-limited. There have been no reported deaths ascribed to the drugs. And for Trikafta in particular, there was one significant adverse event in a patient. It was a rash, but the patient did not discontinue therapy. And in general, across the trials of Trikafta, drug discontinuation due to adverse events was very rare, uh, approximately 1% in the available trials. Next slide, please. 
So uncertainties and uh, controversies in, in uh, the evidence base, um, primarily it revolves around uh, the limited time frame of the trials. The two trials that I um, just uh, uh, reviewed briefly uh, were uh, four weeks and 24 weeks in duration respectively. But CF is a lifelong illness. Um, patients are going to be taking this for decades, likely. Um, and so there's uh, uncertainty about uh, uh, potential long-term harms, side effects that we don't know about, um, and also uh, whether these uh, initial benefits are preserved for the long term. Um, FEV1 is a surrogate measure for CF uh, severity, and changes in FEV1 may not fully capture, or certainly don't cap fully capture the benefits of therapy. Um, so that's an important uh, limitation uh, and introduces uncertainty about the, the other uh, implications of long-term therapy with Trikapta. Um, so the heterogeneity of the disease by gene mutation combination and age of initiation are also likely to impact the magnitude of the benefit. So there are differences, for instance, in the degree of function of the residual function mutations. And so specific gene combinations may respond differently to Trikafta. And also we may, at least theoretically, we may be able to arrest the progression of the disease if we started early in life. So starting uh, patients starting at age one or two, where we have no data yet, may have a very different trajectory uh, of disease than those who uh, are already uh, 25, 30 living with the disease and now start Trikafta. Um, so there's likely a lot of heterogeneity there and, and we really have limited data. Um, uh, one of the great hopes expressed by patients is that they will be able to reduce the standard disease management therapies that are quite burdensome. Um, we don't know that yet. Uh, uh, the C Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is sponsoring a randomized trial looking at uh, reduction in some of these therapies. And finally, uh, at this point, we have no uh, data for patients younger than the age of 12. Uh, there are ongoing studies, and we certainly expect that the FDA indication will be expanded to younger ages as safety data uh, become available in the younger uh, age ranges. Next slide, please. There are a number of uh, potential other benefits and contextual considerations that we should consider um, in thinking about um, uh, the value of these therapies. Uh, certainly there's great hope that Trikapta uh, will reduce the burden of therapy, the number of hours of therapy that patients need to do, will also reduce the burden on uh, caregivers and family, allow greater participation of patients in school and work, and uh, reduce the social stressors uh, associated with living with CF. Um, Trikafta is also the first modulator therapy for patients in that population four I talked about, those who have one copy of the F508 uh, DEL mutation and a minimal function mutation. And as we're all aware, CF is a terrible disease. It has a large impact on both uh, length and quality of life um, and a high lifetime burden of illness. So uh, diseases like that uh, usually value therapies uh, uh, higher and so are willing to pay uh, more money for, for such therapies. Uh, on the other side, uh, as I've highlighted throughout, there is uh, uh, considerable uncertainty about the lifetime impact of Trikafta, and we have to uh, uh, put that into our uh, calculus about the ultimate value uh, of the therapies as we judge it currently. Next slide, please. Uh, so we received a number of public comments, mostly around the evidence ratings, um, and there was concern that we were downgrading uh, the evidence uh, uh, ratings for uh, Trikapta based on limited, uh, limited evidence. Of course, most of our ratings, as you'll see, uh, I think on the next slide, were A, which is the highest rating uh, that ICER gives. And uh, we recognize that the uh, patient community is relatively small, and so that it's challenging to enroll a large number of patients in these trials. So no penalties were given for uh, limited evidence uh, in rare disease, where, uh, as I just said, large uh, trials are difficult. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, among those uh, 12 years and older, Trikapta clearly substantially improves uh, lung function as measured by the FEV1. It markedly improves respiratory-related quality of life, and it markedly reduces the rate of pulmonary exacerbations. The harms appear to be non-serious and self-limited, um, and there are some uncertainties about long-term benefit and the value in uh, younger patients. Next slide. So our evidence ratings uh, for populations two and four, those homozygous for the F508 L mutation or heterozygous with a minimal function mutation, uh, the rating is A, which is superior. 
So there's high certainty of substantial uh, net health benefit. For the population three, those heterozygous for the F508 DEL mutation and a residual function mutation, we have no data yet available to us, um, but uh, we rated it as at least as good as Sim, uh, Simdico, so C++ uh, compared with Simdico, and gave it the same evidence rating we gave for Simdico the last time, a B plus, so moderate certainty of a smaller substantial benefit with high certainty of at least a small benefit. Um, next slide, please. And with that, I can take questions. Uh, thank you for your attention. <clears throat> well, thank you, Dr. Tice. We have, I think, the, uh, we're sort of a little behind, but I think we can uh, handle a few brief questions from the panelists. Um, if anyone would like to um, raise their hand. Okay, well, Jeff, it looks, I'm not seeing any particular question. Um, so great. Yeah, I'm happy yeah. to take questions after the economic review. Um, so, uh, um, oh, it looks like Rena has a question. I'm, uh, okay. Quick yeah, question. Rena, Thank you. Um, I have a question just about the dosing and the packaging, mm -hmm. uh, for Trikefta. Um, it, it wasn't mentioned in the presentation, but the dosing is, uh, two tablets in the morning, I believe. Right. And then one tablet of the uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Caldeco in the evening. And um, I'm just wondering why that was the regimen that was developed. It seems like that would add to the expense to produce two different um, tablets per day for a lifetime for the same regimen. I mean, two, you know, the, the Trikafta and the Caldeco, and maybe it could have been Trikafta twice a day. So I'm wondering about that. And then um, I'm also wondering about packaging. When I looked on their website, it looks very elaborate and very nice, um, the way it's packaged every week, I believe. But it seems like that would also add a lot to the expense. Uh, thanks. I, I, I'm not sure I can uh, really address the decisions of the company in doing that. Uh, I don't know if any of the Experts on the call have any insight into that? Yeah, I can. Uh, I can comment on that. Um, I was going to go ahead, Manu. Go ahead. Um, so uh, I think the the hope was that they could develop once a day dosing, and um, unfortunately, the pharmacokinetics are such that the Alexacaftor and the Tezacaftor can be dosed once a day, but the Abacaftor needs to be dosed twice a day. And so um, it wouldn't make sense to make it uh, make the trikafta or the, the morning pill uh, twice a day because then you'd be overdosing on the alexacaftor and the tezacaftor. Um, and as part of the development program, Vertex also has a once a day uh, ivacaftor equivalent that they're trying to develop. I think the hope is we'll eventually get to once a day dosing. But um, that's why the two different uh, uh, capsules have to be given um, the morning versus the evening. It does create some confusion for patients if they miss a dose, so it is more complex than it needs to be. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think um, we'll go to, I think we have one more person. We'll go to Joy Melancol and then we'll, uh, I think, move on to the next presentation. Joy? Yeah, thanks. So, um, Jeff, you may have mentioned this and it went by me, but I, I didn't hear you talk about the um, overall sort of frequency of these different kinds of CF mutations in the total group of people with CF. And um, so like how many, what percentage of people would these medications potentially be useful for? Yeah, so um, if, uh, so the f 508 del mutation is the most common mutation in the population. Um, and so the populations two, three, and four represent about 90% of patients with uh, CF. I, I can't remember the exact breakdown of the others. I think it's about 40 or 50% who are homozygous. And, and then the, the breakdown in the, um, it looks like Dr. O'Sullivan is nodding. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy with that. They could give the exact breakdowns, uh, uh, but I, I can't remember for the other two populations how that, that breaks down. And of course there, there are still, um, 
uh, maybe 10% of patients living with CF who unfortunately none of these medications, neither Kalydeco nor Trikapta, apply to. So there's still uh, an important unmet need uh, in the population and uh, an area of active research, but a, a challenging um, a set of patients to develop therapies for. That, Thank you. Um, answer uh, your question enough, Joy? Or, yeah. Okay, good. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tice. You want to introduce our next speaker? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, happy to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Karen Kuntz. Uh, she's a, a, a health economist and uh, uh, led uh, the uh, uh, economic modeling uh, uh, that underlies uh, uh, this report. Dr. Kuntz? Um, thank you. Um, so I will present the um, economic modeling now. Next slide. I'd like to first thank um, my collaborators, Kale Wary from the University of Minnesota and Rick Chapman uh, from ICER, and we have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Next slide. So our objective for this analysis was to compare lifetime health effects, costs, and cost effectiveness of CFTR modulator treatment plus best supportive care versus best supportive care alone for CF patients. Next slide. So um, we conducted our analysis according to ICER standards for the reference case, and we updated previously developed discrete time microsimulation models to um, output cost per quality adjusted life year gained, cost per life year gained, cost per equal value, life year gained, and cost per acute pulmonary exacerbation averted. Next slide. So this is a schematic of our model. My, um, using a micro simulation model um, uh, means running one individual through the model at a time, and that allows us to treat variables as continuous, um, which was most relevant for modeling PPFEV1. And so you see on the left, when we have a, a patient entering the model, we assign uh, values for the characteristics seen here, such as age, sex, uh, value of PPFEV1. And then um, each year, we sort of allow them to uh, progress through the model. If they're in a uh, best supportive care scenario, we allow annual declines in their PPFEV1. Um, alternatively, if they're in a CFTR modulator plus best supportive care, um, strategy, we al allow an initial increase in their lung function, we allow an in initial increase in their weight for age Z score, and then their annual declines in PPFEV1 are not as um, large as the best supportive care. They're actually about half, is, um, half the declines as we would model for the best supportive care. And then each year we allow acute pulmonary exacerbations to happen, uh, lung transplantations if the PPFEV1 um, gets low enough, and then quality of life is assigned primarily based on their PPFEV1 um, level. And then the probability of dying each year is a function of demographic variables and clinical variables. Uh, next slide. So just two key model assumptions. First, we assume that the intensity of best supportive care varies by lung function category. The categories are shown here, um, except that given a lung function category, we assume that the costs were the same regardless of, were the same for the, um, for the um, disease management costs, um, whether for those that are on CFTR modulator therapy or not. Um, secondly, we assume that the CF, CFTR modulator drugs decrease the annual number of acute pulmonary exacerbations, both through the increase in lung function as well as through an independent effect. And we um, estimated the independent effect so that it was consistent with the trial reductions in pulmonary exacerbations. Next slide. So because we, um, the recommended start age varies by age, we model sequential drugs in relevant populations, which is shown in this um, diagram. So for example, for um, patients that are homozygous with it for f 508 del mutation, we assume that everyone started on Ercambi at age two. And then for those that are not assigned to lifetime Ercambi, um, they switch to Simdico at age six. 
And then for those who are in the trikafta, lifetime trikafta strategy, they switch that drug at age 12. And all of these are in addition to best supportive care. So um, at switching, we allowed for an improvement in lung function based on the difference in efficacy between the two drugs. And I just want to note that although individuals may not follow these fixed trajectories in practice, our assumption is that the simulated individuals would have the most effective available therapy at all ages. Next slide. So disease management costs included the direct medical costs um, except for pulmonary exacerbations and lung transplantation costs, which were estimated separately. The disease management costs were higher for lower values of FBV1 as shown in the first row. The cost, the cost of each pulmonary exacerbation varied both by lung function and by age, where the younger age groups were higher because they were more likely to be um, in the hospital um, receiving IV treatment. Um, for the lung transplant, we assigned a single cost for the transplant itself in a um, first year costs and then a subsequent year, annual subsequent year costs as shown here. Next slide. Um, this is just the cost, the annual drug cost of the CFT or um, modulator drugs. For example, Trikafta is $311,741 per year. And those are the um, annual costs. Next slide. Um, so we used a linear equation for, um, to um, model the EQ5D utility as a function of PPFEV1. And what's shown here is just the median utility for each category. Um, we also assigned a disutility for every uh, pulmonary exacerbation that occurred and also um, utilities for lung transplantation, a lower value for the first year and then a higher value for subsequent years. In addition, we applied age-specific utilities that represented declining utilities by age as observed in the U.S. population. Next slide. So these are um, undiscounted lifetime health outcomes. Um, the middle column is average number of pulmonary exacerbations um, per lifetime, and these are for the three populations for which um, Trikafta is um, in indication, and we're looking at Trikafta plus best supportive care and best supportive care alone. And so just in summary, across these three populations, oh, sorry, the last column is the percent lifetime with lung transplant. And so in summary, across the three populations who are eligible for Trikafta, we found about a 50 to 53% reduction in acute pulmonary exacerbations over a lifetime, and a 78 to 82% reduction in lifetime lung transplants. Next slide. These are the incremental effectiveness measures, um, quality just of life years gained, and these are discounted 3% per year. Um, and then the last column is EVLYG. So the um, qualities gained ranged from 5.04 to 6.08, again, across the three populations for which, um, who, the, with Trikafta, or for which are eligible for Trikafta. Um, and these are best, uh, the, um, Gains here are Trikafta plus best supportive care versus best supportive care alone. And then the EVLYG estimates are a little bit higher, ranging from 6.06 .06 to 7.03 uh, years. And these are substantial size, um, especially given that they are discounted. Um, next slide. These are the incremental costs. If you look at the last column, the total costs range from uh, 5.3 million to 6.7 million. And then the, the uh, discounted trikafta costs are shown in the middle column. And the difference between the total cost and the trikafta costs are about a million dollars um, across the three populations. And this represents uh, cost savings from both the pulmonary exacerbations averted and the lung transplantations averted. Next slide. These are the base case incremental cost effectiveness results for all the drugs we looked at um, in terms of cost per quality gain and cost per uh, EVLYG. Um, 
the cost per quality gained, all of the incremental cost effectiveness ratios were greater than a million per quality. And for the cost per EBOYG, the, um, they were still above um, at least 800,000 per EBLYG. The Trikafta incremental cost effectiveness ratios were all lower than the other um, drugs, but still um, much higher than commonly cited thresholds. Um, next slide, sorry. Uh, these are, this is a tornado plot. It's one-way sensitivity analyses where we vary um, uncertain parameters, um, one parameter at a time. And um, some of these are, even though they show kind of wide ranges, they're all um, greater than, um, the lower bounds are all greater than $900,000 per uh, quality gained. But the most sensitive, the analysis was most sensitive to assumptions about um, the lung function specific utilities, the independent effect of the CFTR modulators on the risk of acute pulmonary exacerbation and the costs of acute pulmonary exacerbation. Um, in addition, we did a probabilistic sensitivity analysis and found that there was a zero probability of um, trikafta being cost effective at a um, threshold of $200,000 per quality gained. Next slide. So we did a couple, we did several scenario analyses. I'll present two. Um, the first one was looking at a modified societal perspective where we incorporated lost productivity for patients unable to work full time, as well as lost productivity for patients and caregivers due to the occurrence of acute pulmonary exacerbations. And the um, results are shown here for the modified societal perspective and they're a lower, but very slightly lower than the base case, the um, analyses. Next slide. We also um, did a, what we're calling a curative scenario. Um, this provides an extreme favorable cost effectiveness ratio for Trikafta. In this scenario analysis, we assume that patients live a lifespan and experience quality of life similar to the US population. We assumed 100% adherence with uh, medication with Trikafta starting at um, treatment at age six months. And the only CF costs that were um, incorporated were the cost of Trikafta. And uh, we found the incremental cost effectiveness ratio was reduced to 612,000 per quality gained at the current prices for Trikafta. Um, next slide. So several limitations, um, sort of echoing um, the previous presentation, one is that um, we had to model lifetime outcomes um, from short-term trial outcomes. And we did, we were able to capture lifetime, lifetime effect from CFTR modulator treatments, but we had to make a lot of assumptions about that, the um, projection of the lifetime benefit, um, but we're able to evaluate those insensitivity and scenario analyses. Um, secondly, with any surrogate mark of disease, PPFEV1 is not a perfect marker, but using that did allow us to, um, did really help model the um, lifetime benefits of uh, Trikafta. And third, we um, don't have trial-based measures of the modulator benefits on utilities. So um, we were able to um, evaluate this in a sensitivity analysis, but feel that this is a, an area that really needs to be um, improved in the future to get better um, quality weights for these drugs. Next, next slide. So some of the comments we received was, um, again, the lack of the long-term real-world data on these therapies, um, seriously limiting the utility and reliability of the report. And we would argue that actually models are most useful in this situation because we're able to sort of evaluate assumptions um, in sensitivity analyses and scenario analyses. Um, another comment was that the disease management costs derived are not valid estimates of current standard of care. Um, and this was a comment from the, the last report as well. And we did make some adjustments for how we um, calculated this, but we were able to um, receive confidential confirmation from two private payers that our annual costs were actually in line with their observed costs, which made us feel uh, more confident about our approach. Um, next slide. 
So finally, um, to some conclusions, Trikafta, but plus best supportive care substantially improves health outcomes compared with best supportive care alone. However, the proportion in proportion to the clinical benefits, the added cost of Trikafta well exceeds commonly used thresholds for cost effectiveness. Even if we assumed a scenario where Trikafta was curative, we found that the cost effectiveness ratio would only be reduced to $612 per quality at current prices, which still is far from commonly cited thresholds. Next slide. And I'll take questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Koontz. And we'll start with questions from the panel. Um, if, and um, again, please go to um, participant section and raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Um, and we have two here. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Brian O'Sullivan. Thank you. And that was a, a really nice uh, presentation of the data. Thank you very much for that. I was a little confused though when you were, and maybe I missed something. When you're talking about the exacerbation rate in your model, you modeled a 50% reduction, but the trial in uh, patients who had just one copy of the F508 mutation um, showed that the reduction was closer to two thirds and um, presumably in people with two copies of the F508 where the drug can act on more uh, protein, we might see an even further reduction. So I was a little surprised by by the, your choice of 50%. I was wondering if you could explain that. The, the, yeah, the 50, I think you're, you're asking about the um, reduction in pulmonary exacerbations. Correct, yes. Yeah, so we use the estimate from the trials, which you're right was um, greater than fifty percent. The fifty percent was the, was on the um, the model figure, mm -hmm. and that had to do with the declines in um, the improvements in lung function decline. So if in you know the best supportive care, we assumed it was you know two a drop of two percentage points. Um, in the best supportive care, we would now assume it was a drop of one percentage point. And we vary that from, you know, very widely in scenario analysis. So I think that, and that's what we, we don't really have good information on sort of the long-term declines in lung and function. And I understood the slide then. Yeah. yeah. So just to, I just want to reiterate that for everybody. It's the rate of decline in FEV1 over time. Uh, we assume that the decline was slower if people were on Trikafta than uh, as would be normally expected in patients uh, with CF. So and an additional those are, benefit. Those are from data for Kaleidico. So we kind of assume that it was the same for Trikafta as it was observed for Kaleidico. Um, thank you, I think uh, Kim Gregory had a question. Kim? Yes, thank you. Um, on that same slide, what was it just an assumption in, in terms of the reduction of the percent that you're anticipating will need transplants, or where does that number come from? Yeah, so in our model, we're, we're modeling um, FEV1 as a continuous variable, and each year we allow that to decline in the base, in the best supportive care scenario, and then that rate of decline is less in the treated scenario. And so it, when the patients reach 30%, there, um, there's a probability that they will go to transplant. Um, so it's not a hundred percent, but there's a probability. And many fewer of the treated patients ever reach that 30% because they just have a, that initial bump in their lung function and then their decline over time is much less. So that's what drove that reduction in lung function. Again, we, you know, we've never, we haven't observed it in practice, but that was our um, assumption. Uh, thank you, uh, Rita Redberg. Okay, I found the unmute button. Thanks very much um, for the reports for both of them. And my questions are for Jeff and for Karen, um, both. Of course, you know, we wanna do all the effective therapy possible for this um, very serious disease, but I am, I have a question about a report and then a comment about the modeling. But my question, I noticed there was the four week run-in period for the pivotal trial for tri Trikafta. And what always concerns me about a run-in period is people drop out who have serious adverse effects because 
they don't they don't get entered into the trial and i'm wanted to see how was that addressed and why was there a four week run in in the trial and then i'll have a comment after that so um I, I'm, I'm flipping to try and see if i can see how many patients dropped out i think the the thinking was uh, most of the patients were on um either um uh, Simdico or a Cambi before the trial. Um, and the design of the trial was to estimate the improvement uh, of uh, adding uh, Alexacaptor, so the, uh, the Trikafta combination uh, to Simdico. So that they, they assumed that everybody would be on Simdico because that would be standard of care. And they wanted to make sure that uh, they were on Simdico long enough to have the clinical benefits so that then uh, the improvements would, uh, with Trikafta could be uh, captured. Um, I, I'll have to, if you, if you want to uh, make your comment, I'll try and find uh, how many patients dropped out uh, sure. during that run-in period. I don't think there were many, um, but I'll, I'll uh, let you know. Sure, thanks, Jeff. Just my comment is just to emphasize what, you know, Karen rightly talked about the advantage of a model is we can look out on the data, but it's, as you know, models are only as good as our inputs and the inputs are so limited in this, you know, drug that we're going to give to young people on a short term trial with surrogate outcomes that we don't know if they're going to translate. We don't know what any of the long term effects are. And so I and then to have a drug enter the market at, you know, a very high price with such limited data, I would, you know, I think a lot more effort has to be spent on actually getting good data on which we can really make assumptions, you know, about how well it works clinically, not on FEV1, and, and how p patients are truly going to improve because we all want to do the right thing, but it's very hard to do the right thing unless you have the data to inform you. And I don't feel like we have the data to inform us at this time. And so Rita, to address the other question, uh, there were six uh, discontinuations uh, uh, out of the 113 who initially uh, started the run-in period. So uh, a, a little, about 5%. Great, thanks so much, Jeff. So I, I will just- Thank you. Um, Go ahead. We do have a little bit more follow-up data for Kaleidico, and again, in you know a very limited population. Um, so, to, so we use a lot of that information to just kind of infer what we would expect from these newer drugs. So, if anyone has a comment about whether that's a reasonable assumption or not, the clinical folks. Um, and again, I think there's follow-up as out to like four or five years for Kaleidico. Um, um, yeah, I'd like to make a comment. You know, I, I think that um, the patients who were the Delta F homozygous patients, uh, it was a, a four week study. Uh, but the patients in the um, minimal function part of the study, they actually got the drug for 24 weeks. And they have um, one Delta F508 mutation. And the thought is, is that you can infer adverse events fairly confidently across the two different mutation groups. So I think that, you know, in terms of adverse events, I, I think that represents a, a pretty good idea of what the Delta F patients would do. And then in terms of efficacy, um, at least based on the, the way the program has been developed, um, once that initial phase of improvement occurs uh, over four weeks, the FEV1 stays pretty stable out to six months uh, to even out to a year. And so while FEV1 is only a part of the assessment, it is an important part of CF patients. And that, I would argue that is a clinical endpoint that's very important because we know that the best predictor of uh, long-term morbidity and mortality in these folks is their FEV1. So I, I, would, I would not, I guess, uh, say that uh, we, don't have, we only have a four-week assessment uh, in that Delta F homozygous patient. I think there's more uh, granularity to the data. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Um, I'd like to fit uh, Don Kreese's question. If you, if um, I think you still wanted to make a comment, is that right, Don? Uh, yes. Thank. Thank you. Um, I uh, want to ask a question of Karen that has to do with the curative scenario. Uh, out here in patient and family land, there's been a lot of confusion. I think about that curative scenario. 
and also a lot of criticism about ICER's reliance on the quality adjusted life year. Uh, I'm a lawyer and I usually turn to the PhD economist who works for me for insight about economic analysis. So that's essentially what I'm doing here. And I wanna make sure I'm understanding this correctly. And is my lawyer's understanding correct when I conclude that under the curative scenario, a quality adjusted life year and an equal value life year uh, essentially are equivalent. And so when you uh, say that the uh, drug Trikafta is not cost effective under the curative scenario, you're basically rebutting the criticism that says that the reliance on quality adjusted life year is not appropriate and we should be focusing more on equal value life year. Do I have that right? Yeah, I think you're on mute. I'm not sure I understand the question. I do agree that in the curative scenario, the EV LYG is the same as the quality of life year because there's no sort of concerns anymore about saving someone's life that has less than sort of, that has, you know, a decline, you know, lower quality of life than sort of the general population. Um, I, I, so uh, yes, it, it rebuts uh, that, that argument against the use of qualities. Thank you. Rebuts the, okay, thank you. Is that? All right, thank you everyone. I think in the interest of time, we're gonna move on to the public comment and discussion. I will say, I know others in the audience, uh, the attendees uh, have uh, submitted some questions. Um, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to respond to those um, questions from um, uh, directly by the, by the panel, but uh, we're, we will hopefully, please send them in. Um, we're gonna uh, take those, review them, and potentially be able to respond in another way later. Um, so at this point, um, we'll again turn to our public commentators. I'll ask that um, each, each person declare any potential conflicts of interest uh, before uh, delivering uh, their remarks. 